Okay, very good morning to you. It is Thursday 6th of February and just having a, an update then for what's going on in markets at the moment and uh, if you were looking at the positions from yesterday and, and equity markets in particular then yeah, definitely a continuation from where we left off on the close on Wall Street and Asia adding to that. Uh, the S&P and NASDAQ 100 closing at a record high. Uh, so I have seen Sam He's been parading around the office with his 30,000 Dow hat. We're only about 560 points away from that at the moment. So there does seem a sense of inevitability about hitting that point in time. As you can see to me, here's the, the graphic of the, uh, the S&P 500. So that initial coronavirus outbreak fear uh, that they kind of the market had to grapple with for the last week and a half or so completely taken back uh, as we have been discussing throughout a lot of our briefings, although the situation numbers, as we'll look at in a second, are, are still going up at the moment, still seemingly seen as a contained uh, situation. I did actually see some of the mortality rates outside of Wuhan or the, or the area of Hubei, and the mortality rate is about 0.16%. Uh, and as long as those numbers like that remain at those lower levels, I think the market will continue to, to kind of brush it aside to some degree. And then you've had good economic data coming out of the US. Uh, Trump is loving life again, because he's now uh, the impeachment trial has finished. And so, yeah, markets on the, the front foot again this morning. So the DAX playing a little bit of catch up, they reopened up about 107 uh, points this morning. Uh, U.S. index futures have just added on to the gains, and there's a few other positive signs from China looking to looking to kind of issue an olive branch by uh, reciprocating U.S. tariff decreases on Valentine's Day of all days, uh, and that's seen then uh, as another potential positive catalyst for markets. So, uh, at the moment, though, you know, let's not forget that you know yesterday we're at now record territory. So, you know, you, you kind of you don't want to be kind of late to the party and just thinking right blindly this market's now one dimensional um, you know it's lifted for those reasons I've mentioned you know we're looking now for any further catalysts and certainly there could be some to come uh, there's not so much in the way of major US data today but obviously non-farm payrolls just around the corner now that's coming out in tomorrow's session so let's just have a quick look at the other charts uh, WTI crude also following suit with some of the renewed risk appetite. Um, the MSCI index of world stocks, uh, so a combination of all geographic regions, has now been up for four straight days. Asian indices, including Japan, Hong Kong and South Korea, up more than 2% overnight. And so again, this kind of uh, bounce back from particularly when we reopened on Chinese mainland markets on Monday. Uh, just continues to be to be clawed back in that region. Um, so elsewhere, the U.S. 10-year, as you would imagine, a little lower, uh, down about five and a half ticks. Gold, bucking the trend slightly. It's had a slight uptick over the last couple of hours, but basically flat on the session. Uh, and in the currency space, we've just had a little bit of volatility in the euro. Uh, it's very fleeting momentarily. I think perhaps people getting a little bit excited by some of the initial comments here from Christine Lagarde. Uh, the first comment that came out that actually bumped it up higher just a couple of minutes ago was she said low rates and low inflation environment has reduced the scope for policy easing and that is a quite clear hawkish comment however now the other comments come out the eurozone economy continues to require support from monetary policy um, and, and some other more level kind of comments to just nip that little hawkish initial comment in the bud so a little bit of a blip higher, but then has reversed course just now. Um, but she's continuing to speak, so I'll monitor the comments as I'm delivering this uh, briefing. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's get into, stuck into some other headlines. And this was the, uh, the Chinese headlines that I was looking at. Uh, China to halve tariffs on $75 billion worth of US goods from February 14th. The reduction timed... Uh, with to or to coincide with phase one moves by the US. So again, that idea that these are reciprocal in that sense to satisfy part of the interim trade deal. Uh, so this is seen by markets as a bit of an added reasoning for why we, we saw the lift 
uh, going through the Asian session from overnight. In terms of those numbers, uh, where do we reside at the moment is total confirmed cases now to just over 28,000, uh, total deaths 565, uh, total recovered now uh, just over 1,200. I uh, just got a question here actually on the chat. Uh, so how bad do the virus numbers need to get before it causes a serious negative reaction in US and European stocks? Okay, um, I would say it's more about the, well, there's, there's two ways of looking at this. One, I would say one, at the moment, the market is kind of looking at coronavirus and, and, and kind of almost dismissing it. Hence the reason why we're seeing the type of asset class movement we, we have at the moment. But there's kind of two things that I've, I'd be monitoring quite closely. For one, and this is something that JP Morgan said in a research note uh, yesterday, they said any reacceleration in coronavirus cases, and the thing that they're looking at here, as a result of factories reopening. Don't forget in Wuhan, that's a major manufacturing city in mainland China. A lot of car auto manufacturing, for example. It's a large populous area. It's on complete lockdown. You've probably seen the images. There's just no one. The streets are deserted. But at some point, then, that city has to reopen. If it doesn't, think of the, the risk then. Well, that's a major manufacturing center of China for its exports. And so there's going to be a consequence on the Chinese economy. And if that happens to a more severe degree than what markets are expecting in terms of a growth slowdown, that can reverberate across the global economy. So there's, there's dual risks here for China. They reopen the factory too soon and then you see recontamination from the human to human transmission as people get to move around again by reopening facilities or you wait too long and that has a increased compounding effect on uh, the economic slowdown from being on a complete lockdown as a as a quite a large geographic area so that's the tail risk if you like at the moment markets not looking at that but that could quickly come into sharper focus should the um, lockdown go into an extended protracted phase or once they return to work do we start to see a, a reacceleration uh, into almost exponential growth again of the total confirmed cases and subsequently the number of deaths at that point the other second point then is about monitoring of these numbers outside of mainland China at the moment they're incredibly small you know I think if you look at the numbers I mean it's, it's pretty much 99% uh, of all cases are, are in China and of that nearly all of them are in Hubei as, as the area uh, of the deaths almost 549 of the 565 come from that one single area uh, where the apparent origination in the city of Wuhan so unless those outside areas also start to move higher of which to be honest have been very slow then again I don't see that as a risk as far as markets are concerned. So yeah, that, Ian, I hope that answers your question. Um, a couple of things for sure, you know, I'm not looking at this as in uh, the, the coronavirus is now a non-issue, leave it behind. I think, yeah, you've got to look at, you, you, you can look at that in terms of the intraday shorter term environment, but there still are risks and there's still things to look out for. Um, another key thing that moved the markets obviously yesterday was this talk about a vaccine. I've uh, done a little bit more reading around that and my overall interpretation is that uh, you know markets got awfully excited about a snap headline on Chinese TV talking about a research team and a Chinese university had kind of cracked uh, a, a similar drug that can be used as a vaccine but from what I've read earlier this morning um, any type of vaccine to come to market to be used in reality um, would be months away. Uh, generally speaking, then, experimental drugs take much longer. Um, and I think the average time frame in China for that type of situation, even in a fast-track process, is about 640 days. So you're looking at two years to, br to bring a vaccine to market in the best case. Uh, that's, that's almost halved in terms of in the US. And it's about 400, low 400-day 400 time frame. Uh, for Europe and so the, the, the idea or notion that they've just cracked the code so to speak and they can roll it out I think is wishful thinking so 
the key thing here, I think, from an intraday trading point of view, you saw how sensitive markets were to that news in circulation yesterday. And two things I want you to take away from that. One is where the news comes from. So you can see, if you're a new trader, the clear difference in the way markets react to a Bloomberg headline comparative to a headline from an alternate source that takes a bit of time to gain traction and then markets start to kind of build up into a move rather than a major financial news wire snapping a headline and that initial knee-jerk reaction you get. So there's a difference in the way of which the dissemination of news plays out into the actual uh, market price. Um, and then secondly, looking out for then confirmation of the major authorities and what do they have to say? Remember, the World Health Organization came out pretty much shortly after and said, look, this isn't, this isn't the case. There is no vaccine as far as they're concerned from an official basis. So whenever you do get that kind of rumor mongering almost and it does move markets, always think one step ahead then. If you're in that trade, then great. If, you, if you're quite aggressive and you followed that momentum order flow going through the market, but I would suggest being quite pr uh, proactive in management of that trade because inevitably you get a response, an official rebuttal, which often then uh, can reverse the move. So there's ways and means to manage that kind of headline trading environment. Uh, Michael, thank you. So as a statistic, just to finish off this discussion here on the virus, the SARS vaccine took about 20 months, two zero, 20. So again, in fitting with the rough kind of timeframes that we were just discussing. Uh, so the idea, I think, of a, a, a magic silver bullet to come and save the world from coronavirus, I think, is a, is a little bit far off in terms of uh, the practicality of that. All right, move on. Other headlines, because I want Sam to come on and, uh, and do his, his technical rap. Um, the Senate acquits Trump. I don't think I need to talk about this very much. This is completely as expected. Uh, this hasn't had any ramification. Don't don't be fooled by the fact that the markets are seeing this as a as a net positive. He was never not going to be acquitted. Um, we've discussed this many times over the last few months. Rather than this looking at it that way, I prefer to look at it more as what does this mean for uh, his popularity? It's almost vindication, you know, for Donald Trump. I don't know if you've looked at his tweets, but I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more of his tweets coming up. Uh, he's obviously absolutely laying into Mitt Romney, who was the one uh, Republican who stood against the president and convicted him of one of the charges of the two that were on the table. Um, but overall, I think, you know, this was a disaster from the, Demo the Democrats. I, I just don't know why they even bothered. Um, for me, it's almost that kind of uh, uh, that mantra of, you know, if you strike me down, you only make me stronger. Uh, any Star Wars fans will get the reference. The idea being here that this just makes him more appealing, I think. It makes it even more believable that he can spin the witch hunt narrative uh, and get away with it. And so now he's almost bulletproof. You've tried, you failed miserably. I think it's just pretty tragic on behalf of the opposing party. And that's not me being talking up Trump. I just think that they've shot themselves in the foot there um, because it was never going to happen in the first place. So, yeah, completely as expected. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. The story that I do think is a little bit more interesting is this one. Uh, that's talking about OPEC+. Plus. Now, they've gone into an unprecedented third day of their technical meetings. Now, these are technical meetings. This is supposed to be basically catch-up. You know, all these oil ministers catch up. They talk about their adherence to the quotas as part of the, the, the supply cut agreement. But look, I mean, this is the oil chart that we've looked at. I've, I've just kept it the way it was yesterday. But oil prices have now bounced from roughly a, a 40, low $49 mark, and we're up to this morning, 51.73. So we continue to bounce a decent amount in crude oil. Now, we've talked about the um, how key this area is uh, as a pivotal point and the reason why then as a trigger OPEC are feeling that they need to start ramping up the verbal intervention but you know one of my takes from this and, and you know perhaps I'm just thinking about it too much but uh, I think part of the strategy here from OPEC is I don't think they're serious in reducing output this is this is this seems quite clear if you actually read the source reports there's a lot of 
um, disagreement between the two major powers that be, which is Saudi Arabia and Russia. Saudi quite willing to step in and deepen the supply cuts. Russia, not yet. And without those two agreeing, nothing's going to happen because Russia obviously is a bigger oil producer than Saudi Arabia. If one doesn't agree, well then any cuts are for nothing. Now here, I actually think by extending this into a third day, what they're trying to do is if you step out of the oil market, have a rethink about what's happening right now. You know, the market is responding in a very positive fashion. It's continuing to price out risks in the short term of the coronavirus. US economic data has been phenomenal from ISM manufacturing, non-manufacturing, factory orders, ADP was really strong. You know, all of those things are good for demand. So if demand was knocked by a loss of consumption from China being the biggest importer, prices have come back down. I think the strategy here for OPEC Plus is, well, look, let's just extend this meeting. Let's appear to the market like we're thinking of doing something all of the time. All of these external factors are playing positive for price. And if we continue to say we're talking, people will be very reticent to be sat in a short position just in case the tail risk we pull the trigger and cut supply. And so prices naturally are going to bounce. And, you know, with all those things coming together, I think it's a pretty prudent play. If they do this, um, you know, oil prices have stabilized. And if they can see off this week and coronavirus continues to kind of de-escalate almost as an issue, I think they've got away with it. And they've got away with it without firing any bullets. That What I mean by that is using actual physical reduction of supply of crude oil, which is a kind of a last resort, if you see what I mean. You do not want to give the market that every time it challenges you by bumping the price down, you cut. Because what will happen is the price will keep coming down unless you cut, 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 cut. And then you're going to be back in the corner, nowhere else to go then, but deliver every single time. And you do not want to be at the beck and call of the market. You know, it's exactly the same kind of strategies that central banks would do the way that they communicate is what these oil ministers will be thinking. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, so, yeah, that's my kind of take with the oil side of things. So perhaps then those key levels are going to hold out to see off the week, particularly if that payroll data comes out strong and the market holds up here in the equity space. I don't see any reason why, for the moment, then uh, we should push back down lower in the crude market, at least for the moment. Final headlines. Um, we did have German factory orders this morning. They actually came in at minus 2.1%. And actually, that was considerably weaker than expected. And you can see here, German factory orders are down the most in a decade. Uh, in the month of December. Now, the you know, euro, if you looked at it this morning when this data came out, um, I mean, the data came out at 7 a.m. this morning, it didn't really blink. And I think a lot of that is, well, if you look on 2018, 2019 performance, yes, statistically speaking, this is the worst German factory orders in a long time. However, it doesn't really detract from the general contraction of that area of their economy. So it's not massively surprising. But we had that little bump up from Christine Lagarde just a short while ago. You know, this, this certainly might put a cap on any of that uh, acceleration in the euro. And at the moment, I still remain fairly bearish on the euro dollar pair, just given how the positive fundamentals are stacking up at the moment for the dollar. And so, you know, if you're looking at the divergence of fundamentals here, not to say the market has seen an immediate reaction to German factory orders, but they are weak and it does ratify the current stance of the biggest economy in Europe is, uh, is in a state of weakness right now. And on the flip side, America apparently is on fire right now as far as the latest data is concerned. Now, that divergence gives a nice fundamental directional bias for, for the euro and, and trend-wise that has been heading um, lower as well for, for some time. Uh, final things earnings there's a couple of major french companies reporting some of the biggest in fact of their um of the index and the cat courant and some other earnings to be aware of so total their opening price they were up about 2.4 percent 
Uh, Sanofi were up about 2.2%, so Total beating estimates on rising oil and gas output. Sanofi sees profit rising in 2020, so positive earnings as well in Europe to boot. And these aren't small firms. Sanofi and Total are two of the biggest companies in Europe. Uh, you've also had ArcelorMittal, um, Dutch listed up about 10%, Unicredit in Italy up 5%. So there's, there's a couple of other things to be aware of here uh, as well. Okay, quick final look, and if I give Sam the nod to come over now, because uh, I'll be done in about 60 seconds. Uh, you've got this morning, in terms of data, it's pretty quiet in the US, though. Um, nothing really major coming out from a data perspective. Again, non-farms is tomorrow, so perhaps the market starts to fade uh, into the latter part of the, the US session and, and the typical kind of Friday morning quiet period ahead of the, the job data. Uh, but speakers-wise, there's a few things. Lagarde has been speaking. Um, you've got de Guindos, her kind of second in command, also speaking a bit later. I believe separate events. Um, the EU Trade Commissioner, Paul Hogan, uh, speaking at 10. That's obviously mild interest just given now that negotiations are underway between uh, obviously Britain and Europe. Uh, I'm not expecting really anything concrete to come out here but nonetheless he is a important person to monitor going forward over the coming months. Uh, and then Fed's cap plan later on this afternoon. Any fixed income traders you have supply coming out from the Tresor and Tesoro uh, so Spanish and French supply quite a lot coming to market this morning for any bun traders. Alright that is it from me. Hand you over to Sam. Wish you a good day ahead. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, hi, guys. Happy Thursday. Hope uh, we're all doing well. Have good evenings. Let's have a, a quick look over. Well, I guess there's only one place to, to start. Uh, let me just find the mouse, which I seem to have lost. Now I've got it. Uh, SP, Dow Jones, NASDAQ all finishing higher, higher, higher. Let's have a quick look at the old daily chart to... Just put things into perspective. Why are you selling this market? It just does not want to come down. Uh, trading 33.50 at the moment. Uh, unbelievable, really, when we look at it. So if we're going on with this, it's going to continue. Well, you want to be looking to buy some dips. Yes, we had a, a decent push higher. We came back into uh, near those lows. And, uh, you'll be seeing me wearing this very, very soon. You can get these from all it? online retailers. It? Um, the Dow 30,000 hat. You know what? It's coming on soon. We'll, do you want to uh, put it on now or you want to wait? Well, hey, maybe hi. maybe by next week. Okay. Maybe, well, if we have a couple of days like we did recently. Um, but let's have a look at uh, potential opportunities to get in uh, again. You know, yesterday the, the NASDAQ came down quite aggressively, uh, which I was going to bring into picture, uh, and gave that opportunity on those lows of the day. Incredible really uh, and it was that low that ignited the others to, to all go as well so keep an eye because you know the, the way these you know markets can can act is they they just need that further push to to go on and it can drift in the european session so the nasdaq on that high you can see we just touched that again you're also starting to develop a bit of a trend line from the lows of yesterday if that is to to break through then it, it could be that we just come down a bit uh, before that final push, but I like the idea of, of around the the pivot for the Nasdaq. Uh, I don't even think you know it's it's against uh, the realms that we can get there uh, before a push higher. The the Dow Jones, I would like it a bit lower as well. Uh, looking at those previous highs uh, for opportunities to get in, it's just whether we can have that that uh, to that retracement to go from it. It might be that into the uh, the U.S. session we just have what we had yesterday, and that once those highs break you can see here lovely trade in the Dow whether you wanted to get in aggressively on the break of it or you wanted the classic it's pretty one directional since then uh, the S&P very similar breaking the high coming back yes you're offside for a touch but in reality this whole move started once well, let me get to get the trend once we broke through those highs and where was the low of the evening you guessed it right back on that trend line so some lovely opportunities yesterday when it's broken through so yes there could be of course a down day and there could be further developments for this coronavirus but we're on all-time highs and i think it's just one of those 
ones where people have almost forgotten about it and we are looking to, to look for, for longs, more people are going into it. Uh, so just be careful when, when going short, be, be vigilant to, to take profits as and when. The Euro, it's interesting. You know, we were just talking before uh, we started the briefing this morning about that pivot. It's a good place to, to get short. It didn't quite get there, but uh, I think it, you know, a, a tick or two. And, and we're now back down to down to the lows. And of course, you've got quite a lot of support here. Um, if we were to, to break through, though, it could get relatively ugly. And I know there's the, the different levels that people are talking about, lows of, of September, October, i.e. 2019 here as well. So the daily closes are going to be key. Uh, if you're a Euro bull, do you like it enough? I think you probably want to see some bullish price action around these lows before looking to get in. A break of that trend, just be aware of, certainly on the futures anyway, the low than November, and then uh, down to these August lows uh, as well. It uh, could get ugly if that goes. And the pound yesterday, fair play to the bulls. They're defending that trend line like uh, and that area of support like they're life depends on it just doesn't want to close below incredible level of support here uh, but same thing if you're going to get some dollar strength and of course we're at highs at the moment or near enough this market has to push lower as well and then you could see the opportunity to 128 uh, could could come through let's have a quick look intraday uh, just at the pound which is just uh, just well it's choppy around those lows decision time I think for, for the pound will come if uh, later later today perhaps we are getting squeezed from the bottom so just keep an eye on that trend line if that goes if that area goes then fine look for that short uh, from a maybe a line in the sand bullish perspective above the pivot is key yesterday's lows you've got some decent price action there from Tuesday then yesterday evening the pivot one above 130.22 a little relief rally towards 130.50 is not out of the question so those zones that I'd be keeping an eye, obviously longer term for the pound there as well. But this trend line near the near enough the low of the day, uh, the pivot, and then up at 130.56 would be my levels to, to focus on there. Gold uh, is coming back a bit. Um, you know, fair play to the gold bulls. We we broke a key trend line, and I wonder if the the bears are just waiting for that to come back into play here. You can see I'll just move out my camera just now. I've got it on, but you can see going back here to uh, the low of the 14th, the 21st, and then uh, a couple of days ago, that break led to a nice move lower. But do we just need to come back to uh, a better area for this overall short to come back into play? And especially if, if stocks continue to, to push on, maybe this is the you know a nice little opportunity. You've got that retest of the trend line. You've got yesterday's highs as potential place, and then the low around here, other key levels that if you do like the short, I think potato. Uh, patience for, for that isn't uh, the worst idea in the world. Let's have a quick look at maybe some fibs. Trace it there. Let's go from that high of that move. Yeah, you've got the 38.2 around 1561. Yeah, I think a short around there is not a bad little trade to, to have. Interestingly though, just uh, on a more shorter term view than that, we have broken through this nice trend which was respected all through yesterday and then hence that decent push that you've had here. Speaking of trend line breaks over the last few days of course oil has been continuing its, its drift lower um, we had uh, the trend channel that broke it got quite ugly there uh, but just having a look um, at where is it from here you can see that push through late last night in, in oil uh, you're just coming back to an area where it could retest and the gold oil bulls I should say will be looking to defend that trend line because if we do get back underneath it you know it could be <laughs> uh, the, the cue to get short again back to those lows which I know some people do believe are, are still going to come into play uh, also just get this trend line on I would say from yesterday's low for, for oil and uh, if you're looking for a safer opportunity maybe the short on the break of that uh, could be the one uh, to be looking for. European stocks this morning and stocks in general pushing to their highs just finding a bit of resistance um, which from an opportunity to go long later on in the day you're not too worried about uh, but it's just trying to pick those those points but yesterday what we saw I know it was late into the session when all these highs broke and even here in the DAX 
breaks through, comes back, and you're not offside at all. So patience, uh, for sure, is, is, is a virtue in, in these markets. And even if it does keep pushing, just believe that there will be that opportunity to uh, get back in again. As usual, any questions, please do let us know. Euro currently on that low of the day, testing it for the, well, on the hourly chart, 30 minute chart, third, fourth time, really key level. The pound decision time's gotta happen soon. Oil as well, the bulls will wanna defend literally where we're trading now. Gold, potential good shorts higher up. Stocks, if we can get a drift lower to buy the dip, or the classic on that as well, uh, please do let me know. Hope you'll have a, a good trading day, and I'll catch you all later on.